Father in heaven, we thank you for your love that has gathered us together. And we pray that in your love you reveal your very heart and your very mind to every one of us tonight in Jesus' name. We pray that you'll teach your people the things that we ought to know. And as a result of the revelations you are giving us, our lives will become better. You'll enrich our lives. We'll be happier people. We'll be fulfilled people. And your purposes and plans for our lives will be accomplished in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Last week, I gave you an introductory message on God, the matchmaker. And today it is necessary for me to follow up on that message. And I'm talking on God, still our matchmaker. There are people that have ideas that because times have changed, because circumstances are changing, because civilization has taken up or has overtaken us today, that probably the conditions do not warrant God leading us or becoming our matchmaker in marriage. But I want to show you that even though conditions are changing, even though it appears people are more enlightened today than years gone by, that even today it is still necessary that you, as a believer, will take God as the matchmaker. At the beginning of the marriage institution, we read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22, and the read, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. If I were you, if I wasn't married, I will underline the word brought. God brought her unto the man. And you need to understand that God did that because of his love. God did that because of his wisdom. God did that because of his knowledge. God knew what Adam did not know. God could see ahead what Adam could not see. God could measure the need of Adam that even Adam did not realize. And because of that, he said, It is not good that the man will be alone. I will make him and help meet feet suitable for him. And he made that woman. And he himself divinely guided that that woman will be brought to the man. And you should still believe today that God is still able to bring the other part, the life partner, the wife, the husband unto you. In Genesis chapter 24 and in verse 7, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. We come to the case of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham had riches, and he knew that he would commit the riches unto Isaac. Abraham had resources, earthly resources. He knew that eventually he will hand over all the resources unto Isaac. Abraham had promises of the Lord. He knew that all those promises of the Lord will eventually be handed over to Isaac. But wait a minute. Whatever Abraham handed over to Isaac, landed property, resources, earthly resources, even the promises that were given by the Lord, even for future generations, if he did not take care of the marriage of Isaac, something terrible, something great had been missing in the life of Isaac. And so Abraham became wise, and he began to think, he began to plan, he began to make provision for the marriage of Isaac. And what he said is very, very important. He said, that same God that got me out of the awe of the Chaldees, took me out of idolatry, took me out of my background, and saved me, like we say today, he saved me out of a murray claim. That same God will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife 
for Isaac. How was it? The God answer. The answer is yes. In faithfulness to the faith of Abraham, Jesus said over and over and over again, be it unto you according to your faith. And if you are believing God, it will be unto you according to your faith. Abraham believed that an angel will go before the chief servant and through the leading and the guidance of God and through that angel going before, a wife will be chosen for Isaac. Look at Genesis 24, verse 26 and verse 27. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not let destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I've been in the way the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Verse 40. And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk, will send his angel with thee, and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred, and of my father's house. Verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak to thee, bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord as spoken. It was unto Isaac and unto Abraham according to the faith of the family. You see, my brother, my sister, you need to believe God in this area of marriage. Be careful you are not afraid. Because there are people that are afraid and fear is an indication of lack of faith. And if you are afraid and you are always saying, I do not know, I will marry somebody that is not going to be a blessing to my life. I do not know. I may marry somebody that will be like a beast, like an animal, wild and cruel. Be careful of your statement. Because what you fear may come upon you. In Job chapter 4, chapter 3, and verse 25, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of, is come unto me. Be careful of what you say. Make sure that you are not approaching the subject of marriage with an attitude of fear, my brother and my sister. Believe God, we're told in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 29. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And Jesus said that not only to the blind, he said that to other people as well. And he's saying that to us today. If you believe God, it will be unto you according to your faith. The Lord cares about us. The Lord, the Lord has not changed in compassion. He has not changed in love. In Isaiah chapter 49, verses 14 and 15. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a, man, can a woman forget a sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Do not have the idea or the notion that God will ever forget his own. If you are a child of God, you are too precious in his sight. Let me tell you this. Even if you are not born again and you happen to be here tonight, do you know you are so precious to the Lord God of heaven that he sent Jesus to die for you? If he gave you the very blood of Jesus Christ to redeem you, uh -uh, don't you understand that even in your state, if you will look up to God and say, God, I didn't know you loved me so much like that, he will not neglect giving you a good wife, a good husband, if you'll just surrender your life to the Lord. He loved you so much. He will not forsake his own. He created you. He made you. Now for those who are really born again, how precious you are in his sight. How precious you are in his plan. How precious you are in the timetable of God that he says he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Let us believe God and he will do what is right for us in Jesus' name. 
in Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 32. Here are the words of Jesus Christ himself. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. What was Jesus talking about? He was talking of clothing and food and shelter. He said, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Talking about food. What shall we drink? Or wherewith us shall we be clothed? He talked about your clothing and your shelter. Three things. The food, the clothing, the shelter. And Jesus said, your heavenly Father knows that he have need of all these things. Now let me ask you, what is more important to the man, a wife or a shirt? What is more important to a man, a meal or a wife? What's more important to a man, accommodation or a wife? What's more important to the woman? If you told the woman to choose between a husband and a dress, every normal reasonable woman will understand a husband is more important than an ordinary dress. And every woman will know that the husband is more important than the meal, a day's meal or more important than shelter. Now, if Jesus said that God even knows your need of food and of clothing and of shelter, how much more does he know the need of a wife and the need of a husband? And he said in verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. As we consider the point of getting married, marriage for singles we need to find out what's the purpose after all of getting married what's the purpose of having a family because you know there are people that will ask you are you still thinking about marriage you are 40 already now you must think about the purpose of marriage if somebody came to you at the age of 40 and said aren't you thinking about education the first thing you want to ask is, at my age, what is the purpose of that education? And if that man will tell you, this purpose, this purpose, this purpose, and you see that that education is even very necessary for the rest of your life, then you begin to think seriously about it. Now come back to marriage. Here now you are a lady and you are 30. You are a lady, you are 35. And some people might say, why not give up the idea? You are a man, you are 40 already, or you are more than 40 already. Somebody might suggest, why not give up the idea? Before you give up the idea, think about the purpose of marriage. Because if Jesus tarries, and if you are to live 70 years of, to 70 years of age, if you are 40 now, 30 years still remains. And think about the purpose of marriage. Can I do without that purpose for the next 30 years? If you are 45 now, can I do without purpose, without that purpose for the next 25 years? What then is the purpose of marriage sixfold? Number one, partnership. You know sometimes that you could be so lonely in the midst of the crowd because there are deep, deep things in your heart you cannot share with everybody around. There are deep desires in your heart you cannot reveal to people around you. And you feel that you need a companion. You feel that you need a partner. You might be 40. If that need of partnership is there, that's the, that's the reason for marriage. You might be a lady and you are getting to 40 already and you are not married yet and you always feel this loneliness. And the need of companionship, that's the purpose of marriage. That's why God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Let me remind you that Adam had all human, earthly, material resources. The Garden of Eden was so beautiful for him to live in. And all those animals, you know, the excitement of the intellect, just giving names to those animals. And the position, the kingly position that God had placed him over everything that he had made. And the privilege, spiritual privilege he had, that God could be coming to him at the, at the cool of the day every time. Spiritual, material, and intellectual, and mental, and physical needs all surrounded him. 
all the things that he had. And yet God said, in the midst of plenty, in the midst of riches, in the midst of wealth, and even at the height of his intellect and education, it is not good that a man will be alone. You know, sometimes we make a mistake and we think, you know, I'm so rich. I can live in any part of the town I want. Yes, but you are rich and lonely. You know, some people say, you look at the mansion that I live in. It's almost like a palace. Yes, you live in a mansion, but you are lonely. And you need partnership. And you need a companion. That's why God said, it tastes not good that the man should be alone. You know, my brother, my sister, sometimes, even we Christians, we're so spiritual. We know the Bible. We've read the Bible through and through. And we can pray very, very much. And we're so spiritual. At the cool of every day, God is coming to have communion with us. And yet you are lonely. Because, you know, God has created you in such a way that you are incomplete. Ex except for a few, few people. Very few people like Paul the Apostle. Very few people, like Jeremiah, that didn't get married. But for the majority of the people, that need is there. And even at your age, if you're feeling that need of partnership, that's an indication, a tendency towards marriage. Number two, procreation. That means that the child bearing. And if the need is there, you have a lot of property. You have a lot of riches. You have a lot of things. And you are wondering in your heart, you are not married. All these things that I have, when I die, who do I leave them to? Or do I just die and then strangers will come and share everything? And the people that don't have anything to do with me, not my blood relations, they'll just come and share everything. If you are thinking like that, you must be thinking about marriage. Because it's for procreation as well. And it's for legitimate pleasure. Listen to me. Legitimate pleasure. You see, God has created the human body in such a way that there is a need for the legitimate pleasure, physical pleasure, between a man and a woman, between a woman and a man. And if you have that pleasure outside marriage, you have guilt, you have condemnation, you feel dirty, you feel that the whole of the weight of this world is upon you, you become confused, you become defiled, and you cry, and you are sorrowful. Well, to stop all that crying, the legitimate way that God has provided that that pleasure of the body will be fulfilled without any guilt, without any condemnation, is through the avenue of marriage. Number four is the preservation of purity. Preservation of purity. That's why the Apostle Paul said to avoid fornication and remain pure and remain holy. That is, to remain so holy that all these evil thoughts will not be bothering you in your heart. Evil thoughts toward women. Evil thoughts toward men. To avoid fornication. And to avoid all that bad daydreaming. And to avoid all the secret things you are hiding in the heart that makes you to pray every time. Oh God, why am I like this? Cleanse me and put me and all that. He said, because of that, let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. Number five. For the purpose of protection. You see, the woman is called the weaker vessel. How it needs protection. You know, when you have a glass tumbler, glass, uh, a cup, and you have it at the edge of the table, and a little child is running there to go and play there, you run there to protect that cup because it can be broken. But if you have a piece of wood that you use in the kitchen, and it's at the edge of the table, and a child is playing there. You do not worry because that piece of wood is not the weaker vessel. It cannot break. You allow the child to play around that place. The woman is like the weaker vessel. It needs, you need protection. And the only protection that is so secured, so secured, is that you get married and have a husband. Now you man, you might say, well, thank God I'm a man. I am so strong. You know, I think about Samson, that he had a weak point. You know, I think about Elijah, that he had a weak point. You know, I think about a lot of men in the Bible, and I think about you, man. You have a weak point. That weak point may be an emotional thing. That weak point may just be a social thing. That the way you react socially to other people is your weak point. That everything you have done for five or ten years, because of that weak point, you can destroy everything. 
or it may be an intellectual thing that whenever you stand up you make a fool of yourself whenever you open your mouth. And everybody sees that a fool is talking. But you are wonderful in other areas except that weak point. You need protection in that weak point. And who can protect you like a real God sent, divinely appointed wife? You see, for the reason of protection, that's why we need a wife. And we need a husband. And then also for provision. For parents providing for children. And for a man providing for a wife. And for a wife, providing for the husband. Now when I say that, when you are rich, you may not think that you need provision. But you know sometimes you have money, but you don't, need, you don't know what to buy. And it is that good wife, heaven sent wife, divinely appointed wife, that makes use of that money and then is able to buy the things for you. It's your money, but then you don't know what to buy with it. And wife... You may have all the knowledge about this and that, and yet you need a provision greater than your own provision that you have. Because of these reasons, we need to get married. Now listen to me. Not just one reason. There are people that will examine only one reason about having children. And they say, well, my parents had so many children that I'm even catering for those children. And we do not need more children in our family anymore. All the children that my parents brought into the world, they are even enough for me to cater for. And because of that, I don't need to think about marriage. But you're only thinking of one out of many reasons of getting married. The children are there, the children of your parents to cater for. But how about your loneliness? How do you take care of that? How about the fact that you cannot legitimate, ful legitimately fulfill the pleasures of the body? How about that? How about the preservation of purity in your life? How about that? Now you need to think about all the reasons. And if you see that in all these reasons, you need to really get married, then you need to begin to seriously think about all that the Lord is teaching us in this series. As of old, we still look up to God as the only perfect and earning matchmaker who can lead and guide and choose a fitting partner for the unmarried. Now I'll talk about the unbelievers to start with, the sinner, the ignorance of the ungodly. You know, my friend, maybe you are not born again. And you are not a regular member of our church here. And then all these things I say about God providing for you, God choosing for you. And you might say, well, they are saying that about their church people. They are talking to their church members. That's all right for them. No, you need it too. Let me show you. From the word of God, that those things you think are right by yourself, eventually you discover they are not right. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. If you try to choose by yourself without the light and the illumination of the Holy Ghost, without the guiding hand of God Almighty, and without the voice of the Heavenly Shepherd, if you try to choose by yourself, you may discover that the things that look beautiful to you, eventually they make your life ugly and terrible. The thing that you feel will give you great joy, eventually may cause you unnecessary sorrow and heartache. That's why it is necessary for you. Even though you say, well, you are not a member of the church, you just came at this time, you are not here by accident. Do you know something? God created you in such a way that you cannot live a full life without his help. Let me give you this illustration. The manufacturers that make vehicles, they make those vehicles in such a way, you have to bring back that vehicle for servicing at their shop. Because... They hold on to something. They hold on to the spare part. And they do not give you a car to go and ride and to go and use for 20 years and 30 years and never come back. Immediately they sell the car to you. They expect you that you'll, you'll soon come back. When God made your body and made your mind and made your soul and made your spirit and then he, he brought you all together, he made you in such a way that the key to happiness, he held it in his hand. And you need to go back to God and say, God... I've lived now 25 years and 30 years and 35 years and 40 years. I've not known happiness. Where is the key? And God will say, I expect you will come back. The way I made you, you couldn't be happy without me. 
and you can't choose a life partner without God because as a sinner you do not know what will happen tomorrow in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 24 man's goings are of the Lord how can a man then understand his own way you see that man's goings they are of the Lord you cannot fully understand yourself. You need the guidance of the Lord and the leading of His Spirit to guide you in choosing a right. In Proverbs 27 verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You as a natural man, you do not know what a day will bring forth. That is why you need to come to the Lord, Jesus Christ. Accept Him and receive Him as your personal Savior. Having received him as your personal savior, he becomes your shepherd. He becomes your guide. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. I'm weak, but thou art strong. He needs to lead you by his mighty hand. And it is when you come to him as savior, he'll begin to lead you. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, chapter 8, and verse 7. For he knoweth not that which shall be. For who can tell him? When it shall be. The sinner, the natural man, does not know what shall be. There is the ignorance of the ungodly. Who can tell him? Even the unbelievers themselves, they know that they do not know the future. You know what they do? They go to a herbalist. They go to a man sitting somewhere. And he said, well, herbalist, I'm trying to get married. And many people are coming before me. Maybe this or this or this. And you have the reputation of telling people in what direction they ought to go. You see, if you are a little bit educated, in science, we normally perform experiments. And before we make our conclusions, we will refer to the experiments that were performed before so that we can make a proper, legitimate, empirical conclusion right now on the basis of what we knew before. If you were to test it like that, you should have asked yourself, the candidates that have gone to this abalist before, and he predicted for them, and he guided them that they should marry so and so, marry such and such. What's their marriage like now? I tell you something, those people, they are looking for greater abalists to, re to readjust and rectify the mess that the original abalist put them into. And you are taking your load again to go to that same abalist. You want them to mess you up again. They have never got the truth. Abalist does not know the future. The people of this world, they do not know the future. The future is in the hand of Almighty God. And they will not reveal it to a abalist. Therefore, you need to come back to the Lord. That God himself will direct you enough for the natural people. Now, you are a believer. And you are saying, I have Christ within me. I'm a child of God. Whether I pray or I don't pray, I cannot make a mistake. That's what you think. Next week, I'll be showing you how John Wesley got married. And in his marriage, he had difficult, difficult, difficult time. Terrible time. Let me just show you before you come next week, one of the terrible times he had. If you get hold of the book, Lord Break Me by William MacDonald. There is a page there that we're told that the wife of John Wesley will take hold of the air of his head and be pulling him around the house. Think about a wife like that. That will take hold of that man and be pulling him around. From last Saturday, I've been studying on the marriages of people like John Wesley, people like Martin Luther, and people like others like that that I'll still be bringing to you in the series of studies. And I will show you next week how John Wesley got married. But listen to me, John Wesley was a mighty man of God. He preached many, many sermons. He preached more than 40,000 sermons. And when you read some of the sermons he preached more than 200 years ago, they are weighty, they are terrific. Not only that, he wrote commentary on the whole Bible. A man that knew the Bible so much to write the commentary on the whole Bible, that's a mighty man. And if you read his commentary on the New Testament, they are wonderful and they are deep. But in this area of marriage, he didn't know what to do. And eventually the person he got married to, 
and I'll show you how he did it later. The person he got married to, it was so much trouble, so much trouble. The slander that that woman cost him, the terrible thing, the way he even tried to destroy the Methodist church at the foundation, I'll show you everything. And yet, this man was a real Christian and a real preacher. You may say maybe he got married to her before he became a Christian. No, sir. Even after he became a born-again Christian, after he became a preacher, after he became an Italian evangelist, that's after he married the woman, and such a great mistake. That's why I'm telling you that even we believers, we need the direction of the Lord. And I pray that the Lord will lead and guide you in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Remember, Samuel was not a novice. Samuel was that person that knew the Lord from an early age. He heard the voice of the Lord. He saw the visions of the Lord. He got directives and prophecies from the Lord. Can you think of such a man making a mistake when choosing a king now? Listen to me. There was another time that he had even chosen a king, the first king for Israel. And he was right on the dot. He knew the mind of God. He wasn't a novice. He wasn't a young person. The Lord had been speaking to him from a tender age. But now at this time, look at the mistake he made. And if the Lord had not corrected him immediately, that mistake would have been something that will bring national catastrophe. And you know, you as a believer, if the Lord does not guide you, if the Lord does not direct you, the mistake of marriage can become a lifetime catastrophe. That's why we say, even the believer is insufficient in taking a decision, wanting to get married. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we, we believers, we children of God, even we ministers of the gospel, preachers and apostles, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. You cannot direct your steps. You need the guidance of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 16. Isaiah chapter 42. Verse 16. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. Oh, you say, but that's talking about a blind man. And I'm already a child of God. Before I continue the verse then, you may need to read verse 19. Who is blind but my servant, child of God? You hear that? You say, are we blind? Yes. We are blind to what will happen tomorrow. We are blind to the future. We are ignorant of what that woman will become. We are foolish. We are ignorant of what that man will become. Who is blind but my servant. Or deaf as my messenger that I sent. Who is blind as he that is perfect. And blind as the Lord's servant. I just told you about John Wesley. That man's eyes were opened when it came to the doctrine of sanctification. His eyes were opened when it came to the need of the sinner. His eyes were opened when it came to church management. His eyes were opened when it came to interpreting the Bible. 
his eyes were open when it came to the techniques and the methods and the approach of preaching. But as it came to choosing a life partner, who is blind but my servant, and deaf as the servant and the messenger that I have sent. In verse 20, seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears of many people, yet he heareth not. Now come back to verse 16. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them, and not forsake them. The Lord will not forsake you. The Lord will not leave you alone to choose for yourself. We children of God can make mistakes, costly mistakes, serious mistakes, painful mistakes, heart-breaking mistakes, life-destroying mistakes. If we're left to ourselves to decide and to make choices in life by ourselves, if we're left without God's guidance, believers, we are blind in serious matters of eternal value. We are but of yesterday, but the God we're dealing with is the ancient of days. Look at Job. Chapter 8. And verse 9. Job, chapter 8, verse 9. For we are but of yesterday, and we know nothing, because our days upon the earth are a shadow. That's why we need to depend upon God's guidance in this area of marriage and in every important decision of life. Now let's see the importance of God's guidance. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. When the Lord shows you favor and he gives you a real life partner that will support your life. That will be a lifter up when you are discouraged in life. Woman, a man that will nourish you and cherish you and love you and take care of you. I will not allow you to keep on weeping and crying in your life. A man with the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ that will love you as Christ loves the church. A man that will give everything and make everything that he has available to take care of your life. Man, a woman that will be a supporter, a lifter up, a person that will encourage, a person that will submit and respond, a person that will know that God has given you a gift from above. That's what we are talking about. If it's just to get married to any dick and hurry, if it's just to get married hurriedly in time and forget about it and then continue to suffer for the rest of your life, there are men outside, there are women outside. And there are people that if they want to marry tonight, they just go out and they're looking for, and there are people that are looking for somebody that they can get married to all of a sudden. But let me tell you, sudden marriage is a step to sudden death. The heartache, the agony, the suffering, the crying, the tears, all the turbulence that comes into somebody's life because of sudden marriage is a terrible gamble. Never do it. But you know, if you will pray, if you will look up to the Lord and seek God's guidance, whoso findeth a wife, a real wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 14. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife, a good wife, a supporting wife, a caring wife, a submissive wife, a God-sent, heaven-sent wife is from the Lord. That's what you want. That's what you want. That you'll be able to say, the Lord brought her to me. And will the Lord do that today? Oh yes, the Lord will never forget you. The Lord will never forsake you. The Lord will still care for his own. I'm reading Psalm 37. From verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. 
delight thyself also in the Lord, and it shall give thee the desires of thine heart. You desire a good thing, trust in the Lord, delight in the Lord, and have faith in God. It will be unto you according to your faith, and it will give you the desires of your heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and it shall bring it to pass. Psalm 84 and verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Already you have read, he that findeth a wife, a prudent wife, a wise, a good, loving wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. Here it says, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. You just walk uprightly, the Lord will plan your marriage for you. The Lord will provide for you. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. You are praying about marriage. God has told you he will listen to you. He will not reject your call. And then he says, ye shall seek me, and ye shall find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 7. Ask, it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. Can this be talking about getting healed alone? Can it be talking about having money alone? What if God heals me and then I have a bad wife? Sickness is even better than a bad, trouble, a troublesome wife. What if God gives me money and then you have a bad husband? What, what is the money worth if you have a bad husband? You will not even enjoy the money. And so Christ was not only talking about asking for money, asking for healing. Oh yes, he's talking about that too. Not only talking about salvation, talking about that too. He's telling you to ask for something that is deep and seriously needed in your life. And he says, if you will pray, everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. God will open his door for you, and he will provide for you. For you. God is still our matchmaker. We're ignorant, but he's all knowing, he's all knowledge, and he's omniscient. We are imperfect, but he is perfect. We have made many mistakes already. He has never made any mistake. We are often influenced by emotional strain and stress. We are often influenced in our decisions by past experiences and present environment. But God is eternally the same. Woman, you can easily be deceived by the appearance of a man and the empty promises they give. Man, you can easily be deceived by the appearance of a woman, by their disguise. But God can never be deceived by any disguise of, of men or women. Look at First Kings chapter 14 from verse 1. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is a hijah, there is a hijah the prophet, which told me that I shall be king over these people. You see, Jeroboam, he had a need. He felt that Ahijah will be able to supply that need. But he said, if Ahijah the prophet, if he knows my true color, if he knows that you are my wife, he will not give you the right answer. So let's make a disguise. My brother, there is a woman out there. He's wanting to just put herself upon your life, dump herself in your home. 
and she might be saying, if he knows my true nature and my true color, he is not going to accept me, but I am going to disguise myself. And you know we are all ignorant. And woman, there is a man out there. He will look nice for one month and then look very terrible for the next 35 years. He will look very simple, very religious, very spiritual, very, very nice for one month or for six months. But for the next 40 years, he is Mr. Devil. But now he will disguise. And in the talking and the appearance and the caring and all the things that he says, you will say, I never found a good man like this before. That's because we are blind. That's because we do not know the future. So Jeroboam told the wife and said, disguise yourself and go to Ahijah, the prophet. Verse 3, and take with thee ten loaves and crannels and a cruise of honey, and go to him, and he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see. A man of God, he could not see. A prophet of God, his eyes were set by reason of his age. Verse 5. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for his sake. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, For it shall be, when she cometh in, she shall feign or pretend herself to be another woman. Our God is perfect. Our God is a God of knowledge. He knows all those pretenders, all those counterfeits that are trying to deceive us. And in verse 6, and it was so, when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet, as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam, why feignest thou thyself to be another? Thank God for the revelation of God. God will give you that revelation. God will not leave you alone. He knows everything in everybody's heart. He knows everything in everybody's life. He has promised that he will guide you, and he will guide you. He will guide every one of us aright in marriage. He will guide every one of us in the decisions we are taking in life. The Lord will not leave you alone. Depend upon God, he will give you the desires of your heart. Let's rise up and pray. Let's talk to the Lord that God will not leave us alone to choose for ourselves. God is... It's a God of knowledge. It's a God of wisdom. It's a God of love. He will direct you. He will